Welcome to this colloquium. So today we have uh, Professor Klaus Blaum. Uh, he's the director of MPIK, which is for nuclear physics. But as we were just discussing, it's uh, a lot many things more than nuclear physics that is done over there. Um, and Klaus is an expert in, in penning trap mass spectrometry as well as um, uh, spectroscopy to some extent. So uh, I would rather not spend time on introducing him, but uh, just to, to complete, like he, he is of course well recognized in, in, in the field. And uh, very recently he had this Helmholtz Award, which basically given by PTB for precision measurement. And he'll mostly be talking about precision measurement, but applied to fundamental test of nature. Klaus, welcome. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot Manas for the kind introduction, also for the kind invitation to come to here. It's not my first time, I had once a stop here for two hours and then continued to Australia. It's the first time that I'm here for a couple of days and I enjoy it a lot. I've seen a couple of labs and I'm really impressed by the science that gets done here. There's a bit of overlap because we are also investigating high precision experiments, in our case to test nature or fundamental laws of nature. And I will give one example on the most precise test of charge parity time reversal symmetry by comparing matter and antimatter. And uh, that gets done with cooled and stored exotic ions. With exotic ions, in the first part of the presentation, I have in mind radioactive ions, some of them having only half-lives of a few milliseconds. And I will discuss the applications of the mass of these species towards the test of fundamental symmetries. In the second part, I go on to the already mentioned comparison of the charge to mass ratio of the proton and the antiproton for the string and test of CPT symmetry. And then in the last part, I go on towards a measurement or the most precise measurement of the mass of the electron by using highly charged ions. So again, a very exotic system which we can produce in our laboratory. Let me give a kind of a flavor for what I'm going to talk about in the next 45 minutes. <laughs> so this is uh, the fields of applications. And what you see here is a kind of an artist's view. What is displayed here is the binding energy per nucleon which is typically in the order of a few MeV in the nucleus, as a yeah, function for the different isotopes. And you clearly see here the so-called valley of stability. And as soon as you go more exotic to the left or to the right, so to the neutron-rich or neutron-deficient nuclides, you go up in this binding here and you might reach the, the um, trip lines, the neutron and the proton trip lines. So we are interested in nuclear forces and to probe nuclear forces. I won't discuss today nuclear astrophysics. We did a couple of mass measurements specifically for the investigation of neutron stars, of the outer shell of neutron stars, what is the composition of a neutron star and so on, what is the production of heavy elements. I will focus more here on fundamental interactions like quantum electrodynamics and test of symmetries. And uh, to highlight that, I would like to give here kind of an animation. What you see here is an Escher image. So you see I assigned the particle as this uh, dark horse and the antiparticle as this bright horse. And we now let the experiment run, so it looks like that. And now we apply symmetry, and we all know the symmetries. Namely, I start with parity. So you put a mirror here, exactly at this position, and you get this image here mirrored to this image here. I hope you can agree to that. So that's parity. In the next step, I move on to the charge symmetry. Rather to change the charge, I change the color here. So exactly at this position here, the dark becomes bright and bright becomes dark. And you know, the last missing symmetry here is the time reversal symmetry. So we let the experiment run backwards. That's exactly what happens at this position here. And amazingly, these two images perfectly agree, except that there's a shift in one row, which is a 180 degree phase shift, as it should be if you do the theory right. Of course, we are not comparing images, so we don't compare this image to this image after we have applied CPT, but we, uh, uh, but we compare properties, fundamental properties of particles like the charge to mass ratio or the magnetic moment of proton and antiproton, for example. Okay, let me start with the atomic mass measurements or nuclear mass measurements and the field of applications. So what you see here in this list is the relative mass uncertainty required on a the energy scale here, in order to probe different questions in the different fields of applications. So 10 to the minus 5, that corresponds to about 1 mega electron volt uncertainty, is sufficient to discuss questions in, in chemistry, for example, the composition of different uh, molecules. 
For nuclear physics applications like nuclear structure physics, whether the nucleus is deformed, oblate or prolate or spheric, you need a relative mass uncertainty of something like 10 to the minus 6. That corresponds to if you have a 100 atomic mass unit heavy nucleus, that corresponds to something like 100 keV. Astrophysics is about 10 keV. And we are mostly focusing on this lower part here, where you really have to go down to the electron volt scale or even the milli electron volt scale in uncertainty. For example, I will give two examples from neutrino physics. I will give one example from a test of charge parity time reversal symmetry, where we have reached 10 to the minus 11 in the mass uncertainty of the proton and the antiproton that corresponds to the milli electron volt scale. Or test of quantum electrodynamics and highly charged ions, again on the electron volt to milli electron volt scale. Remember, the only way to do that at the moment, to reach this precision or precision below 10 to the minus 9, is by using Penning-Crab mass spectrometry, which I will introduce. Let me first come back to the binding energy. So we distinguish between the atomic and the nuclear binding energy. So you see here the nucleus. The sum of the, or the mass of the nucleus is given by the sum of its constituents. So you have here the neutron mass. You have z times the proton mass and z times the electron mass minus the binding energy or given here in this equation. For the binding energy, we distinguish between the nuclear binding energy, which is typically 8, 9 MeV per nucleon, that's this here, which is a relative contribution of something like 10 to the minus 4, but if you would like to probe that at the 1% level, you need a mass uncertainty of 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the minus 8. For most of these cases, these are exotic systems, very short half-life. However, Depending on your precision you can reach, you can also probe the atomic binding energy, which is in the order of a few electron volt. Take the hydrogen atom, which is 13.6 electron volt. So you need, in order to probe that, at least a relative mass uncertainty in the order of 10 to the minus 10 or better. That gives us access, as it is indicated here, to all forces acting in the nucleus, for example, which is the strong force, the weak force, and the electromagnetic force. How to do that? So what is our device? how to measure masses of exotic species. Well, you have to build a balance similar to that what is shown here. And on one hand side, you have the ion of interest where the mass is unknown. And on the other hand side, you have the reference ion. And well, it would be good if they match, but we can measure the difference between these two. In most of the cases, we try to use the carbon atom, 12 carbon, because the unified atomic mass unit is defined as 1 12 of the mass of carbon 12, so it doesn't has, have any uncertainty by definition. The mass of carbon 12 is 12.0000 and so on, atomic mass units with no uncertainty. So you do not introduce any uncertainty by your reference. Of course, you have uncertainties in the measurement scheme and so on, I come back to that later. Ideally, you take a mass which is very close to your ion of interest. So if you go to heavy species like gold or so, you need a heavier reference. To that end, we are typically using carbon clusters. So multiples of carbon, C2, C3, C4, C20, C24, and so on. And the only uncertainty that you introduce here in addition is the uncertainty in the atomic binding energy, which is luckily only in the range of milli electron volts. So 10 to the minus 12 or so. No limit at the moment. Of course, we don't build a balance like that. Rather, we would like to have as the measured quantity a frequency. And you all know that here, of course, in this uh, CQT, that the best quantity you can measure is a frequency. So we have to assign to the ion of interest and the reference ion a frequency. Then you measure the frequency ratio, which gives you the mass ratio. And the way to do so is that we store our ion with a charge to mass ratio here given as Q over M. In a strong magnetic field, it's typically a 7 Tesla field, and the ion reveals an oscillatory motion given by the, uh, by the centrifugal force, which equals the Lorentz force. So you can get the two-dimensional confinement by the strong magnetic field. We can confine the ion up to months, as you will see later. But of course, the ion is allowed to escape along the magnetic field lines. So in order to avoid that, you superimpose a weak electrostatic potential Weak in our case, that's typically 10 volts, which we apply as a voltage difference between the end cap electrodes and the ring electrode. You see already here that we like to have this hyperbolically shaped end cap electrodes because that gives you x square minus y square potential. So the force is linear dependent on the distance from the center 
towards the electrodes. Of course, you would like to have an as perfect field adjustment as possible. However, for most of our species, they get produced externally. They have to get injected into the trap, so we have little holes here in the upper and lower end cap in order to bring the ions in and out again. And to that end, we have to add a few correction electrodes, what you see here on this image. So these are correction electrodes to the ring and to the end cap electrodes. Overall, the ion motion looks like it is indicated here. It's a superposition of three independent eigen motions. First, you have this so-called modified cyclotron frequency. Modified because you have, an, an, uh, in addition to the true cyclotron frequency based on a magnetic field, the electrostatic potential. You have an E cross B drift term, which is referred to as the, sorry, this one here, that, that's the magnetron motion. It's an E cross B drift motion. And then you have the axial oscillation, which is solely dependent on the potential and the size of the trap. So what is the frequency we are finally interested in? I already mentioned it. It's the so-called cyclotron frequency given by the charge to mass ratio times the magnetic field. And that's very neat in our experiment. We do not need uh, so much theory here because this equation is rather simple. The only thing is that in order to measure the mass of the ion, you have to know the charge state and you have to know the magnetic field strength. Of course, to measure the frequency down to 10 to the minus 11 to get the mass down to 10 to the minus 11 requires that you know the magnetic field to 10 to the minus 11, which you can't do with standard systems like a Hall probe or NMR imaging. So what we are doing is that we measure first, and I come back to my balance, a reference ion where the mass is known. From that, you calibrate your magnetic field. Then you measure the unknown species, assuming that the magnetic field is still the same. And then you measure again your reference and you interpolate to the time when you did the actual measurement. That's at present the limit of this few times 10 to the minus 12 because of the stability of our superconducting magnets. There might be ways around. However, it's not that easy. This, this equation looks so easy, but already from this plot here, you can see that you have a few more motions. And there are two equations from which you can extract then the true cyclotron frequency. Either you take the sum of the two radial motions magnetron and modified cyclotron, or you take the so-called invariant theorem, which says that the sum of the squared of these three independent motions gives you the true cyclotron motion. This equation has the big advantage that even in the case that the electric and magnetic fields are tilted against each other, this equation still holds in first order. So that allows you, even if you have a non-perfect field, to still get the true cyclotron frequency. So this is about the storage and the frequency, but how can we measure the frequency of the ion of interest in the reference ion? There are two techniques at the end. One is called a destructive technique. So you measure the particle by getting rid of it. The other one is called non-destructive because you measure the frequency by still keeping the ion in the trap. The first one is the destructive time of flight. So you have stored your ion in the trap and you have probed the ion motion by an external driving field. So your ion is sitting, we try to cool it to the center with a typical amplitude of, of only a few nanometers, but now you would like to probe its motion. And that we are doing by applying an external radio frequency field to excite the motion to a few micrometers or so. In order to see how much energy the particle has, gave, has gained in its motional mode, we eject the ion from the trap to the detector and measure the time of flight. And that's given here. That's the time of flight, which is something like a few hundred microseconds, because that is about two meters upstream, the detector, as a function of the excitation frequency. And if you scan the frequency by always reloading the trap and emptying it, you get such a spectrum. And the minimum here, so that's a well-known function, the so-called sync function, and the minimum here gives you the true cyclotron frequency. So from a fit, you can extract the frequency. That gives you here immediately a kind of 10 to the minus 8 measurement. However, Okay, what you can do on top, you can do a kind of a Ramsey excitation, rather to have one single excitation pulse, you can separate it to two excitation pulses and a waiting time, then you get a spectrum like that. However, this measurement scheme is limited by the Fourier limit. So if you look for one second on the particle to measure the frequency, the line width is one hertz. It's one over the observation time. So we can only get down to something like 10 to the minus 9, and then there is a fundamental limit, or you store the particle for minutes or hours, which we can't do for the short-lived species if they have half-lives of only a few milliseconds or a few 10 milliseconds. Most recently, we came up with another neat idea, namely not only to use the time 
information the ion needs from the trap to the detector, but also to use the information where the ion hits the detector. And I discussed it with Lee yesterday in her laboratory. That's what we are doing here. So you eject the ion from the trap to the detector, and we monitor not only the time of flight, which we get by pulsing the electrode down here, which is a start signal, and the, the hit on the detector is the stop signal, but we also measure where the ion hits the detector with a resolution that we can calculate back to the position of the ion in the trap to better than one mi or about one micrometer, one to two micrometer. Because that allows us now not only to measure the frequency as it is given here, but also to measure the phase of the ion in the trap. So we can now clearly say whether the ion was sitting here and the reference ion was sitting here 90 degrees separated, plus of course a few hertz, or whether it was 95 or 100 or 180 degrees separated. And that allows us to get the resolution strongly increased, namely by that you beat the Fourier limit given by 1 over the observation time times the phase resolution, which is delta phi over 2 pi. And we get here clearly a phase resolution of something like 5 degree. So you immediately gain a factor of 100 by taking in addition the information to go down to 10 to the minus 10. The most precise technique to measure a frequency is in our case non-destructive, namely by measuring the induced image current. So if the ion revolves, revolves in the trap, of course that's now exaggerated, as I said, the oscillation amplitude is only a few micrometers, even below maybe 100 nanometers, it induces by its oscillation a current in the electrodes, and that current can be measured by a very sophisticated pickup system. So you see here a kind of a low noise cryogenic amplifier together with an LCR circuit that's tuned to the frequency of the ion. So what you see here is, the, is kind of the Johnson noise. So that's uh, the amplitude, the voltage amplitude that, is, that you get as a drop across a resistance as a function of the frequency. So that would be the Johnson noise. And on top of that, you see the signal induced by the ion. You may now wonder, typically what you would assume is a peak as a signal because you have induced the current. However, in thermal equilibrium, so when our particle is at 4 Kelvin temperature, it acts itself as an LCR circuit, but 180 degree phase shifted. So it shortens the noise to ground. That's the reason why you see this dip here. So exactly when both are in the on the same temperature level, it acts 180 degree phase shifted, and you see this dip here. And within a few seconds, we reach 10 to the minus 11 uncertainty, a few times 10 to the minus 11 uncertainty in the measurement of the frequencies. That's what we're going to apply in the last part of my presentation, yeah, as it is indicated here, 10 to the minus 11. So how does a typical penning grab setup look like? You see here a photo, and uh, that's the typical size. Uh, that's well, okay, I shouldn't have used the European coin here, right? So, uh, okay, it's uh, similar of your coin size. So that's about one cubic centimeter in a volume. And uh, also the trap itself is rather small. So that's something like three centimeters times three centimeters. The entire system is much, much bigger because you have not only to produce the, the, the elements you're interested in, you also have to prepare them, cool them. We do not yet apply laser cooling. We will do so soon. So what you see here is, is, a, is a reactor. It's a research reactor at the University of Mainz where you produce radioactive ions by neutron-induced spallation. You extract them, feed them into an ion source, mass separate them, guide them into a penning trap, and then you measure the mass of these ions of interest. I should mention here that we are doing this specific experiment together with colleagues Wilfred Nerdershäuser and Christoph Dullmann from the Technical University of Darmstadt and the University of Mainz. So let me come to a few applications, and I bring only one from nuclear physics, because I know that this is not a nuclear physics institute, but... Uh, I have at least to give one example, and uh, it's a rather simple one. Namely, what happens if you look for the separation energies of the neutrons you might add to the nucleus? So you have a specific nucleus, let's take uh, 12 carbon, and now you add a neutron, 13 carbon, it exists. What is the binding energy of the very last neutron you have added to this nucleus? You can calculate that, well, you can measure it, first by measuring the mass of 13 carbon, then by measuring the mass of 12 carbon, you know the neutron mass, so the difference must be the binding energy. Now you continue, you add another neutron, so you get 14 carbon, still exists, radioactive, but you can measure again now 14 carbon against 12 carbon and you get the binding energy of the last two neutrons. And you continue, 15 carbon, 16 carbon, 17 carbon, 18 carbon and so on. So you do that along an isotopic chain 
which we have done on uh, numerous isotopes, in this case in the heavy mass region, so you see here lead, you see radon, francium, and so on. And the way to extract the binding energy is by measuring the mass of the two species, as it is given here, mass of the two species, atomic binding energy we can neglect here, and you extract the nuclear binding energy. If you, would, if you would do that for every single neutron, you would get a kind of an odd even staggering because neutrons and protons like to come in pairs. So therefore, you're typically doing it via the two neutron separation energies because then that smears out. And that's what you see here. So the one neutron separation energy is about 6 to 8 MeV. The two neutron, neutron separation energy is then between 12 and 16. So what can you learn from this plot? You can learn a lot about nuclear structure. For example, here you see a steep drop exactly at 126. That's obvious because it's a magic number. Similar as you would go in atomic physics from the binding energy of the electron of noble gases towards the next element, then the binding energy drops a lot. Take helium, 23 point something electron volt. If you go to the next one, lithium, it's only 3.8 electron volts. It's the same in nuclear physics where you have these magic numbers, the closed shells of neutron and proton number, and that's exactly here. So that's known. But, you, but what you also see is rather not only to have the smooth trend because of a liquid drop model, you also see these effects here, and this is deformation. That's when the shape of the nucleus change from oblate to prolate, or from spheric to oblate or to prolate. This is a clear signature, and you try to understand that from nuclear structure theory. We did that. These are known numbers. These are magic numbers which are known since, since decades, from Jensen, who developed such a model. But we were interested in, if you go more and more exotic, whether these magic numbers remain or whether new magic numbers come up. Nobody tells you that as soon as you get very exotic on the neutron number, that there might be a new number which is magic or that gives you additional stability. And that was predicted for the chain of calcium isotopes, mostly because it's, uh, it's doubly magic. So there are two stable isotopes, calcium-40 and 48, that have 20 neutrons, 20 protons, or 20 protons, 28 neutrons, which are magic numbers. So we were interested in what happens if you go more and more exotic. So 48, you add another neutron, gives 49 calcium, 50, 51, 52, up to 54. I should mention here for 54 calcium, you can produce at the world best machines only about one particle per second. And you still have to do the experiment. The half-life is very short. It's something like uh, 50, 60 milliseconds. So you have, to, you have to be very fast. What you see here is th that what was known before. So that's the two neutron separation energy along the neutron number for the calcium isotopes. So of course you see at calcium 48, you see the steep drop, and then it was expected to continue smoothly. However, when we did the measurement uh, two years back, we noticed that all of these previous values were wrong. You might now say, but they got very well predicted by theory. Yes, that's true, but they got adjusted by theory. So you take them as an input parameter, so therefore they agreed. The reason why they disagreed was that theory forgot to include, include three nuclear forces. That's a very new development in, 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 nuclear, astro, in nuclear theory, that you have not only the interaction, the next-to-next -next interaction, so you have also to include now three-body interaction. And uh, when that got done by a colleague, uh, Achim Schwenk, this agreed extremely well. However, what you also see here is that there is this magic number at n equals 28, and there's another one at n equals 32. There's a steep drop in the separation energy exactly here. It was the first discovery of a new magic number in, uh, in exotic systems, which we then published uh, uh, yeah, two and a half years ago. With that, I would like to move on away from nuclear physics, now going into uh, neutrino physics. There's, of course, a big hype after the Nobel Prize has been given last year to the uh, to the signature that neutrinos must have a mass because of the neutrino oscillations. What is still unknown is what the absolute mass value is and what the mass hierarchy is. Which of the neutrino type is the heaviest ones and what is the mass? And there are several teams looking into that. Among others, it's the Karlsruhe tritium neutrino experiment looking into this decay. It's tritium that decays to three helium. You emit an electron and you emit a neutrino. How can you extract from that the mass of the neutrino? Well, you can do so as soon as you know the mass difference of tritium and helium, and you measure the, the taken away energy by the electron. 
the missing energy must have been taken away by the neutrino. And that gets done by measuring this type of endpoint spectrum. So the released electrons, you let them fly against the potential. You increase the potential up to the level where you assume the mass difference or the energy difference between the mother and the daughter state, which is around 18.6 kilo electron volt. And you measure the number of electrons that just pass over this barrier. And uh, if you end up in a value that's different from the maximum energy you have available, this must be the remaining mass of the neutrino. That would be the very first direct measurement of a neutrino mass. And the present best limit is 2 electron volts over c squared, taken from this Mainz and Kreutz experiment. And uh, this is the literature value on the Q value, which is the mass difference of the mother to the daughter ion. At that time it was 1.2 electron volts and the neutrino limit, neutrino mass limit was given by 2 electron volt over c squared. They aim now for a factor of 10 and even up to 100 in improvement, so down to an upper limit of between 20 and 100 milli electron volt over c squared in the hope to see a signature of the absolute mass. That recalls that you need to measure this Q value here, so the mass difference of the mother to the daughter ion, down to something like 20 milli electron volts. That's a 10 to the minus 12 measurement. And recently Ed Myers, a colleague from Florida State University, reported on a measurement of this Q value of the mass difference of tritium to helium with an uncertainty of 70 milli electron volts, really an amazing, amazing precision. It's um, uh, 4 times 10 to the minus 11. We in Heidelberg aim for a measurement at the 7 times 10 to the minus 12 level, so this 20 milli electron volt level. To that end, we have built up a dedicated panning grab. You see it here. It doesn't look so nice, to be honest, because it's a rather old magnet. But the requirements you have in order to avoid any disturbance from the environment are huge. So, for example, our room at the moment is temperature stabilized to something like 10 millikelvin per day. So even if the outside temperature changed by 4 or 5 degrees, the room temperature inside still remains within 10 millikelvin. Our magnetic field stability is meanwhile down to about uh, 5 parts per trillion. That's 5 times 10 to the minus 12 per hour. On a minute measurement scale, that's something like 10 to the minus 14, so we are not worried about magnetic field variations. And the entire apparatus is based on a is vibrationally isolated and stabilized floor in order to get vibration amplitudes of less than 0.1 micrometer. And just a few weeks ago, we have done the second best mass measurement ever performed in the world on 12 carbon 4 plus to 16 oxygen 6 plus at the level of 1.4 times 10 to the minus 11. Just a factor of two missing to the aimed precision in tritium to helium. The reason why we are using uh, 12 carbon 4 plus is because it has the same charge to mass ratio of 3 to 1. And we didn't want to spoil our apparatus with tritium as soon as we have not yet reached the final precision. But the technique is identical because 12 carbon 4 plus is the same yeah, 3 over 1 ratio than uh, tritium and helium 1 plus. We will see how far we can go in the next few months. Another application of this precision mass data, also from neutrino physics, is not to investigate the beta decay where you emit an electron neutrino or an anti-electron neutrino, rather to look into the electron capture decay. One good example here is the electron capture in holmium, holmium-163. It captures an electron from the outer shell into the nucleus and it transfers the proton plus an electron to a neutron plus an electron neutrino. <coughs> and now again you can measure the endpoint spectrum, but now you get an upper limit on the, ele on the electron neutrino mass, not on the anti-electron neutrino mass, as it was given here. This is the anti-electron. Rather you get it on the electron neutrino mass, and you can see how these two compare. So that would be a kind of a CPT test on the neutrino sector. Also that requires to measure the endpoint spectrum, and that has been done something like 20 times in the past. And there have been uh, a lot of values that totally disagree with each other. So I plot the last 10 ones. The most precise value accepted in literature is from uh, about 20 years ago at 2.5 kV with an uncertainty of only a few 10 electron volts. Most recent measurements by microcalorimetry, which gets used to measure the endpoint spectrum, indicated more a value of 2.8 kV, kV with an uncertainty of a few hundred electron volts. So it's a uh, three sigma, four sigma effect. 
And it wasn't, people weren't sure whether this is based on the fact that you use this kind of microcalorimeter. So there might be some intrinsic effects like phonon excitations that might take energy away, so therefore you might get the wrong Q value. So what we did is we did a direct measurement by comparing the mass of holmium to dysprosium, and this is our value. The uncertainty is smaller than the size of this dot here, so there's no doubt about the, the Q value, and that gets now used in all of these experiments in order to check for the mass of the electron neutrino. Last example from mass measurements is now the comparison of the mass of the proton to the antiproton. Again, the same technique. You build a kind of a balance where you measure subsequently the cyclotron frequency of the proton to the antiproton to the proton to the antiproton. So the proton and antiproton are their own references. However, and that is a homework for you, but we might discuss that afterwards, we didn't use the proton. We used H minus. Nice trick here. You might think about why that. So we measured the, the antiproton mass, not against the proton mass, rather to the H minus mass. In this experiment, the, the entire system, including the electronics, is placed in an environment of minus 270 degrees centigrade, so it's a 4 Kelvin environment. The pressure is 10 to the minus 16. In fact, it's at the moment 2 times 10 to the minus 17 millibar, which we only know as an upper limit, because we could store our antiproton for more than seven months. And the only way to lose it is by annihilation if it has a hit with a rest gas atom. So we could calculate back that the, un that the number of rest gas atoms must be below seven in the entire trap volume. And then you can, because we reached, we reached uh, again, we reached this kind of, now it's 13 months or so of a single antiproton. This is the comparison. So this is the frequency, the ratio of the ex experimental versus theory, assuming that CPT is, is right. And uh, a difference towards one would indicate that CPT is, is not correct here. So these are kind of 6,000 individual measurements plotted here in a histogram. And that's the result. It's a 10 to the minus 12. So you see here it's a one point. So this is the ratio of the charge to mass ratio of the proton to the antiproton. You would assume if CPT holds one as a result. And you see it's a 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 with an uncertainty of 69 on the last digit. Okay, it's of course uh, luck that it hits so perfectly, this one here could be within, this is one standard deviation. The uncertainty here is mostly uh, coming from, uh, from the effect that, and that gives the, the indication to this H minus, that we had to apply a few corrections. If you measure the antiproton towards the H minus, it's not that easy. Of course, you have to correct for the two missing electrons first for the first electron to get H and another electron to get H minus. That's not a problem because we measured ourselves in another experiment. This is now the last part of my talk. We measured the mass of the electron down to one times 10 to the minus 11. So that's well below this here. In addition, it gets divided by the mass of the proton, so it gets suppressed by a factor of 2000. You also have to correct for the polarizability because the electrons like to make specific motions. You have to correct for the binding energy of the electron to the proton and you have to correct for the binding energy of the electron to the hydrogen atom, which is the electron affinity. If you plug that all in and then we get a certain uncertainties, which is the number here, mostly not given by this equation, mostly given by the experiment. We can discuss that later. With that, I would like to move on to the last part, namely test of bound state QED and the mass of the electron. The technique which we have used before is absolutely identical. Again, it's a penning trap, single stored ions, in that case, highly charged ions. In fact, even hydrogen-like systems. So you remove all electrons except one. So carbon has six electrons, we remove five, and only one remain, so it's carbon five plus. We could do the same for calcium. Calcium has 20 electrons, we will remove 19, and then we have calcium 19 plus. I should mention here that this gets done in collaboration with Günther Wert, who was already a guest here for a couple of weeks in the group of Manas Mukherjee from the University of Mainz, Wolfgang Quinn from GSI in Darmstadt, and the theory on bound state quantum electrodynamics got done by Christoph Keidel from the Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics. The motivation was, in the first instance, to test theory of bound state QED, really to provide the most stringent test on the bound electron. On the free electron that has been done by Gabrielse and uh, Kinoshida on the theory side, 
We would like to do it on the bound system because this changed quite a lot because the, uh, the parameter that you have to develop is no longer alpha, the fine structure constant, but it's set alpha. Let's imagine you can have a nucleus of set equals 137. That would mean that set alpha is 1 and you cannot do that any longer this way. And we are going towards heavier and heavier systems to see how much that, how, how that develops. The reason why the field is so strong here, why, it's, or is, or why we are using bound state systems, is that the field, the electron C's of the nucleus gets extremely high. So the field strength here is given in volt per centimeter. That's 10 to the 16. The best, strongest laser available at the moment is about 10 to the 12 volt per centimeter. We did measurements at 10 to the 14 volts in calcium, and we aim for 10 to the 16 volts per centimeter by using hydrogen like lead. Okay, what the quantity we are interested in is called the g-factor. It's the proportional constant between the spin of the particle times Bohr's magnetic moment and the magnetic moment of the particle. g equals 2 plus, now comes a certain number of correction terms, relativistic correction, QED correction in first order, self-energy vacuum polarization, nuclear size correction because the nucleus is not point-like, it has a certain size. Then two loop corrections, so you can have a virtual, not only virtual pair, but double virtual pairs. You have a recall correction and so on. And if you look for the contribution of all of these correction terms towards the G factor, you get it here. So the two would be somewhere up here. At the level of 10 to the minus 3, or in that case, yeah, 0.02 contribution, you have the Dirac contribution, the QED contribution, first order, second order, nuclear recoil contribution. Nuclear size contribution comes in at the level of about 10 to the minus 10. So if you would like to test QED, taking into account nuclear corrections, you must reach at least 10 to the minus 11 precision in order to probe this contribution here. If you would end up in your uncertainty somewhere here, you could not probe all of these here. So our aim was to go down to this level here in order to probe these type kind of contributions. And these are some of the Feynman diagrams which you have to calculate in order to, to get the numbers. We did experiments on 12 carbon 5 plus at this level here, and we did experiments on 28 silicon 13 plus, most recently on, ca on uh, calcium 19 plus. This is the, this the, the, the heaviest system we have investigated so far. Okay. What do we have to do in order to measure experimentally the magnetic moment or the G factor? We have to measure in addition to the cyclotron frequency another frequency because the G factor is related to the Lama frequency. The Lama frequency is the spin precision frequency, so you have your electron that precesses in the magnetic field. And the precession frequency is given by the G factor half times the charge to mass ratio times the magnetic field strength. How do we know the magnetic field strength? Well, by measuring the cyclotron frequency of the, of the ion, because the electron is bound to the 12 carbon ion. So you measure the charge to mass ratio of the 12 carbon, you extract, and you, you, then you, well, that you know, you, you measure the cyclotron frequency, and then you can plug in this magnetic field here to this equation here, and then it cancels out, and you get this equation. Of course, both frequencies have to be measured simultaneously. Only then the magnetic field cancels out. So finally, the G factor is given by twice the Lama to cyclotron frequency ratio times the charge to mass ratio of the ion and the electron. I should also mention here, this experiment gets also done at 4 Kelvin temperature. We have also reached here a vacuum of 10 to the minus 17 millibar because our calcium 40 19 plus ion got also stored over months. And uh, in that case, it's, since the trap is bigger, it's about 20 gas atoms in the trap volume. How to measure the Lama frequency? Because it's not a motional frequency, so you cannot measure it direct by the induced image current. It's an internal frequency of the spin or the spin precision frequency. However, we are making advantage of the idea of Stan Gerlach, namely by using an inhomogeneous magnetic field, as he has done at the time when he detected the spin, the splitting of the spin states in a very inhomogeneous magnetic field here by imprinting it on this detector here. 
We are using a type of a continuous Stan Gerlach experiment because we superimpose to the very homogeneous magnetic field an inhomogeneous part so that the ion sees all the time or the electron sees all the time the inhomogeneity. However, you cannot do that in a single trap because unfortunately in our case the inhomogeneity is so strong that it would disturb any cyclotron frequency measurement where you would like to have an as perfect field as possible. So you have to split these two measurements of the Lama frequency and the cyclotron frequency. Okay, what does this continuous stern gerlach experiment help us here or effect helps us? Well, I mentioned in my introduction that the axial oscillation frequency is only dependent on the potential and the charge to mass ratio. This inhomogeneity here adds a certain potential to our storage potential depending on the spin state. So when the electron is spin up or spin down, it sees a different potential. So this here varies slightly depending on the spin state up or down and therefore the axial oscillation frequency changes between spin up and spin down state and that is indicated here. That's an axial frequency measurement. The axial frequency is something like 700 kilohertz and the spin, uh, the frequency difference and the axial oscillation between spin up and spin down is something like 300 millihertz. It's only a 10 to the minus 7 effect but the stability is so good that we can easily resolve that. So you see here spin up state, spin down state, spin up state, spin down state. Now what you have to do is you have to, okay, I should mention here that of course we have indu induced on purpose a spin flip here by irradiating it with a microwave. Otherwise the spin state would be stable forever. It stays in its spin state forever except when we induce externally a spin flip by applying a microwave. That gets done here. The way to measure now the Lama frequency is by varying the microwave frequency and you count the number of spin flips. As mentioned before, that you have to do simultaneously to the cyclotron frequency measurement because you would like the magnetic field to cancel out. But that you can only do in the inhomogeneous magnetic field while you would like to measure the cyclotron frequency in the homogeneous magnetic field. The idea to solve that uh, goes back to Kinder Wirt and colleagues and it's, done, it's shown here in the following. So we start with our hydrogen-like ion with a single electron in this so-called analysis trap. What is the spin state? We don't know at the beginning, but we can measure it. So we measure the axial oscillation frequency and we induce a spin flip. If the frequency goes up, we would know that the spin state was down. If the frequency goes down, we know that the spin state was up. So this is up, down, in order to test it once more, we induce another spin flip and it goes up again. So now we know that at this position here we have started with a hydrogen-like atom where the electron is in the spin-up state. Now we move to our precision trap where we have a very good homogeneity, 10 to the minus 9 per cubic centimeter. That takes, we do that adiabatically, it takes only a few seconds. Now we, me now we induce here a spin flip by a microwave while measuring simultaneously the cyclotron frequency. That gets done here. Takes about 10 minutes. The question is now whether we have induced a spin flip or not. We don't know here, we can't see it. So we have to transport the ion back to this inhomogeneous magnetic field and we measure its spin state and that gets done here. So you see our ion started in this trap here in the spin up state but it came back in the spin down state. So clearly we have induced a spin flip here. You might now argue, well, maybe it got induced by doing its transport. No, we did the transport 10,000 times without having induced any single spin flip by collision or so. So that was clearly a signature of the induced microwave here. That you do for something like four months, about 8,000 times. And then you plot the number of spin flips as a function of the microwave to the cyclotron frequency ratio. Then you get this resonance here. Obviously, close to saturation, it's 50% spin flip probability. And then you compare that result to theory. So this is our experimental G factor in the case of 28 silicon 13 plus, hydrogen like silicon, 1.995348958.7, which matches perfectly with the theoretically predicted value. That's the best test of QED ever done, bound state QED ever done. Unfortunately, the uncertainty here in, Q, in the theory is, is, is higher than the experimental uncertainty, mostly because 
the nuclear size contribution was not well known enough here. The uncertainty given here in the experiment is the statistical uncertainty, mostly from this line with here, that's the five. The three is the uncertainty in the silicon mass. And amazingly, the uncertainty, the biggest contribution is coming from the electron mass. It's the uncertainty, so it was limited by the fundamental constant of the mass of the electron. But that triggered us the idea to go back and to measure the 12 carbon system. Because 12 carbon has the advantage that the mass is known by definition, the uncertainty is zero, so this drops out here, except the binding energy of the electrons, which you have to correct for. We might improve our statistical uncertainty, I show you on the next slide. And theory is much, much better here. The reason why theory is better is because the nuclear contribution scales with set to the third power. So the nuclear contribution is an order of magnitude, two orders of magnitude smaller. So this comes down to 0.1 or so. In order to improve the statistics, we use the phase sensitive detection technique, similar to that what I've introduced at the beginning. And our line shape gets that. It's the same measurement, but only a tenth of the time and using phase measurement rather than a frequency measurement. That's amazingly narrow. I mean, it's a factor of 100 narrow here. So we were able to reduce that to 0.05. That drops out. That gets re reduced by a factor of 100 in the 12 carbon system. So the idea came up, why not to measure the electron mass by assuming QED to be right. So you invert now the initial idea rather to test QED, which we did here and have proven to be right. We go back to the light system and extract the mass of the electron. And that got done. So you invert this equation here. So you have seen this equation before here. Now you invert it, you take the electron mass given by the theoretical Q, uh, G factor times cyclotron lamma frequency times the mass ratio. So you have, to correct, you have to add all of these terms here. And then you end up in the world best measurement of the mass of the electron. This was the previous literature value based on measurements in the former group of Günther Wert. And this is our actual value, factor of 13 more accurate. I like to give this number in, in, in U, in Unified Atomic Mass Units, because then you can add three zeros here. Of course, the relative uncertainty remains the same. It's, a, it's a 4 times 10 to the minus 11, but still uh, the number looks much more impressive. And the biggest uncertainty at the moment here is coming from image charge shifts. So the ion sees its self-induced image current in the electrode and, and gets repelled by that. And we, are built, we have built now a new trap, which is a factor of two bigger, and this effect scales with the third power of the, uh, of the charge state. So uh, it goes of the size of the trap. So this goes down by an order of magnitude. This was statistics. So we can improve, and we are aiming for that for another factor of 10 in uncertainty in the mass of the electron. Last experiment, the most recent ones, what we did is we were interested in going, as mentioned, to heavier systems. What can we learn if you go to heavier systems, specifically if you take two different isotopes, namely calcium-40 and calcium-48? Well, the nice thing is, if you take the ratio and the g-factor of these two, all contributions cancel out except the ones coming from the nucleus. In that case, it was lithium-like system, so three-electron system, electron-electron correlation cancels out, the Dirac uh, contribution, all of that cancels out except the nuclear recoil and the nuclear size, because this one is 20% heavier than this one, because you have added eight neutrons. This system is specifically neat, because if you look for the nuclear size, the nuclear charge radius, you notice that it's almost perfectly identical. It's not understood at all why this is the case. In nuclear physics, that's a big mystery why the charge radius of calcium-40 and calcium-48, of course, you can say you only add neutrons, that's true. They have no charge, but still they rearrange the protons, so the charge radius should change, but it's perfectly identical at the level of 10 to the minus 4. That means that in the ratio, also the nuclear size contribution cancels out. And what remains is only the nuclear recoil contribution. And that allowed us, by measuring the magnetic moment or the g-factor of calcium-17+, plus, calcium-40 to calcium-48, to probe for the very first time this nuclear recoil contribution, which we did, it just got published a, a few days ago. And you see here the numbers. So all of the standard QED part, QED in order alpha and alpha squared, they are identical. They cancel out. You have the nu finite nuclear size contribution. That's this number here. That also cancels out. 
And what remains as the nuclear recoil contribution, it's this number is here for calcium 40 and 48 that doesn't cancel out and we were able for the first time to probe that in this system. What comes next? Well, as mentioned, we would like to go to heavier systems and especially we would like to go to hydrogen like lead. Lead has 82 electrons, so you would like to remove 81 of them and to measure the G factor of this last remaining electron. And it has a couple of applications. First, you can test QED. As soon as that is tested, you can use not only hydrogen-like systems, you can also use lithium-like systems or boron-like systems. The idea behind this that if you take the ratio of these two, all nuclear contributions cancel out because it's the same nucleus. Only the number of electron changes. And then you notice that the biggest uncertainty in that is coming from the fine structure constant alpha. So you have the possibility by measuring the G factor ratio of hydrogen like lead to boron like lead to improve by an order of magnitude the fine structure constant alpha. Totally independent on that, what is based on at the moment, namely on the measurement of the G factor of the, elect of the free electron, which is QED and not bound state QED. So that's what we are aiming for. Of course, a very complicated experiment, so it's now set up complicated by itself because to produce in the lab 81 plus lead is, is complicated by itself. You have to introduce that now, it's no longer a closed trap, but you still have to remain this 10 to the minus 16 millibar because otherwise the storage time of hydrogen like lead would be incredibly short. We need at least a few weeks of storage time. And uh, the reason why we can extract the fine structure constant alpha is that in the ratio, so the 1s hydrogen-like system, the electron is sitting in the 1s state, for boron-like systems, the electron is sitting in the, 2S, in the 2p state. Sorry. And if you take the ratio, what remains is this term here, the pi term. And that scales with set alpha. So that's the reason why you get access to the fine structure constant alpha. And we believe that we can improve it by an order of magnitude. What you also can do is, and that's indicated here, it's maybe a, what, a bit complicated plot. So what it shows is the relative contribution to the G factor for calcium-40, which we have already tested, in light gray, and for lead in this dark color. The achieved uncertainty is 10 to the minus 11. That's our experimental precision. So you could see in the case of calcium-48 calcium, calcium-40 calcium and 48, we probed easily two-loop QED. We just managed to probe the nuclear recall and nuclear size. We were not able to probe any higher order in nuclear physics, like nuclear deformation, because the effect is so small. However, go, however going to this higher set systems, you get immediately access to, for example, the two-loop correction in set alpha to the fourth power, because that scales with set to the fourth power. You also get access towards nuclear deformation, and most interestingly, at least for me, is you also get access to myonic corrections. So you do not create only electron-positron virtual pairs. In this high field, you also produce mi, pl mi plus, mi minus, even pi plus, pi minus virtual pairs. And that's able, that would be the very first time that that could be probed compared to the G minus 2 of the muon experiment, which we know it differs by 3 sigma from theory. That would be a ni very nice test on that. With that, I'm at the end. So I hope I could show you some exciting results with cooled and stored exotic ions I mentioned in the first part experiments on nuclear mass measurements for nuclear structure studies, but also for neutrino physics applications. I mentioned the most stringent test on CPT symmetry by comparing the charge to mass ratio of the proton and the antiproton. Then I moved on to the hydrogen-like exotic systems where we were able to test QED, bound state QED on most stringently. We did measurement of the electron mass, so presently the best known value is based on our experiment. And we also did the first measurement of the proton G factor, which I did not report here, but also at the level of a few times uh, 10 to the minus 10. What comes next? Well, we aim for an improvement of the electron mass by another factor of 10. We know how to do that simply by building the trap bigger. We would like to measure also the G factor of the antiproton, similar as we did it for the proton and the electron. That would allow us to improve that by a factor of 1,000. We have to see. But at the very end, I would specifically like to thank uh, the people that did the work, 
I have the honor to report here, but this is my division on stored and cooled ions at the Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics, a big team. And uh, I would also like to acknowledge the collaboration which we had on the TRAP field with many, many groups around the world, with many institutions. And last but not least, uh, thanks once more for the kind invitation and your attention. Thanks a lot. Okay, in a nuclear reactor is that, uh, that you put in a heavy sample, either uranium or californium, and then you have uh, neutrons, free neutrons, by the reactor process itself, and they induce neutron spallation. So the neutrons, since they are not charged, mm -hmm. they enter the nucleus of uranium or so, and then the nucleus, uh, the, the nucleus you get uh, fission. So it falls apart, and then you get radioactive species from that. These radioactive species, you have to cool down in a helium buffer gas atmosphere and then you extract it by, uh, by this gas flush. So it is more like a probabilistic uh, method? Right, okay. right, yeah. And how do you create these high charged ions? I mean, how does it involve 20 electrons? Okay, the way to do it is that we have a very strong electron gun. Well, not so strong as that what I have seen this morning as electron and proton guns, obviously. But we have a rather strong uh, electron gun, which we shoot on a target. In one case, it was a silicon target. In the other case, it was a calcium target or a carbon target. By impinging this beam on the target, you release atoms from the surface that enter the trap. And as soon as, as it sees the electron um, current, it gets ionized. And it gets subsequ subsequently ionized higher and higher. It gets, meanwhile, trapped by the strong magnetic field and electrostatic potential, and simply by the collisions with the incoming electron. So it's electron bombardment. You can go up. And then depending on how long you bombard it and how intense the current is, and especially what the applied voltage is, you can breed, in our case, internally up to cal calcium 19 plus. Going to heavier systems, you can't do that any longer in the trap itself. For hydrogen like lead, we need 120 kilovolts of voltage. So that gets done externally by a called electron beam ion trap that can deliver this high electron current and high, high voltage, produce it there, and then deliver it to the trap and capture it in flight. Right. What is, what is the limitation there? You said that you can improve by factor of two. Yeah. Right. The, uh, Ed Myers was not able to do a direct comparison between tritium and helium. So he had to go via H2. So he measured the ratio of tritium to H2, measured the ratio of helium-3 to H2, and extracted then the Q value. But this is not a direct Q over M doublet, because the mass ratio is 2 to 1, and that introduced uncertainties. So it's simply the measurement scheme he had to apply, where we are able to use directly, we have a double trap, so we have in one trap we have tritium stored, and the other one helium stored, and we can just exchange them all the time, so we make a direct measurement. So he was limited by systematic uncertainties caused by the mass ratio difference. Uh, what do, do you mean, uh, strategy or applications? Strategy, how, how, how do you actually kind of measure something that will last for a few milliseconds? Okay, it's simply that you store them only for a few milliseconds. I mean, the, statistically, you get the best accuracy if you store them about three times the half-life. You can simply calculate, you lose in statistics because the species decay, but you gain in statistics the longer you store them because of the Fourier limit. And if you match these two equations, then you see that about the fact uh, three times the half-life gives you the best match. So if you have a species that lives 100 milliseconds, we excite and store it for 300 milliseconds and measure then the uh, frequency. 
The shortest lift species ever measured got done by this technique by Jens Dilling from Vancouver, which was uh, 11 milliseconds. That's the shortest lift species measured so far in a penning grab, about 10 milliseconds. Okay. If there is no more questions, let's thank Klaus again. Thanks a lot.